Hi everybody, and thanks for joining me today. So working on tail feathers again today. Yeah, this one should be fairly interesting because it's lots of bright colors. And yeah, I am not working in my usual diagonal direction because the feathers are sloping that way, so I've been following them. So that is why it has ended up like that. I find it just goes a little faster to follow the colors, so. Yeah, it's not too cold still, so that's nice and clear. <laughs> yeah, I had a little bit of freezing rain, so that was fun. <laughs> uh. But yeah, we're just plugging away. As you can see, like I said, a lot of confetti because there is a ton of pin stitches here lot of colors to tie off so all right 37.87 so yeah not much new but I don't mind <laughs> I like my routine so I don't complain about things being boring <laughs> uh, yeah we're uh, working through all the new Star Wars content on Disney been quite enjoying it. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I felt it's it's held up pretty well. I'm happy with it. Well, no matter what you make something new, there's always going to be somebody who doesn't enjoy it, right? <laughs> yeah. Right now we're working through um, uh, the Obi-Wan uh, miniseries, so yeah, that's been that's been fun. Yeah, the only complaint is <laughs> these days, miniseries seem way too short because, you know, I've gotten spoiled on shows that are like 200, you know, episodes. When you only get like six to eight episodes, yeah, <laughs> they seem gone in the blink of an eye. Uh, but yeah, I was reading about the, like, behind the scenes stuff and there was... Um, Ewan McGregor was saying he knew for about four years that it was in development and he couldn't tell anybody, you know, because he was under contract. I'm like, oh man, that would have been hard. Yeah. Not to get to tell everyone you're going to play that iconic character again. Yeah. And apparently, um, so John Williams, who was a huge um, soundtrack uh, composer, especially in the 90s, he... Um, had retired from the Star Wars franchise, but he did come back for this one because he said he'd never constructed a theme for Obi-Wan like he had for other characters, and he kind of wanted a chance to do it. So yeah, yeah, he got he came back for that. So that's pretty cool because I was curious to see if it was the same composer because I found a lot of it has a very similar feel to the original music. And um, like a lot of the newer stuff did not have the same composer but yeah the person who took over it did a really good job of capturing the similar themes and similar feel I felt of the original music and I even like um they do scene changes very similar ways to the original movies you know with the it wiping across the screen or whatever yeah so I thought that was pretty cool <clears throat> yeah and then I said in um, The Mandalorian, they did a deep fake for um, Luke, basically. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'm amazed at how good the technology is now. It's really hard to tell. Yeah, because um, the actor, Mark Hamill, said actually he would have preferred if they had recast it with a younger actor. But, I mean, that wasn't something in his creative control, so... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's going to be, they said, a fourth season. But uh, they had it all written and then the strikes happened. So, yeah, we'll see. 
Yeah, that was a very long strike, <laughs> big disruption. But I mean, that was the point, right? Yeah, because yeah, shows are finally coming back now, February, March. So obviously the seasons are going to be a lot shorter this year. Okay. Yeah. Well, while I was waiting for new stuff to come back, that means I, I went through a lot of stuff on my uh, Tubi watch list. Uh, T U B I. Yeah, it's a free app. All you have to do is watch ads, and then yeah. Although I was kind of annoyed, I was watching stuff on CBC Catching Up, and they play the same like five ads every commercial break, and. They have like six commercial breaks in a one hour episode so yeah it gets pretty tedious after a while like yeah the uh the commercial might have been funny the first time but it certainly isn't you know the uh 70th time <laughs> um, well i could pay for the cbc gem premium and not have ads but i'm cheap <laughs> i said yeah i refuse to pay for more than one streaming service at a time we we get one we watch everything we want to watch on it then we cancel it and move on to the next one and yeah by the time we've gone through all of them you know there's a uh, new stuff on the first one kind of thing so yeah there's only so much time so yeah <laughs> yeah so we had prime for a few years now we're on the Disney Plus, so. Yeah, I didn't know Disney Plus has a lot of other, they got stuff by National Geographic and by Star and, uh, which, not to be confused with Stars TV, <laughs> which is different, but yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I had a leftover piece, but it's a bit too short. This is an old color, so yeah. When I took it off the bobbin and cut it into pieces, the pieces are not the same as all my others, because after that now, I, I always take each uh, new skein of thread and I unwind it and fold it in half three times to end up with eight equal pieces which is kind of nice because then they're all the same length even from color to color so but yeah this one ended up shorter that was one of the reasons I stopped doing bobbins as I found at the end I would either end up with a piece that was much shorter than I wanted or I would end up with a super long piece which then if I cut I would end up with two pieces that were shorter than I wanted to but working with a super long piece was sort of just asking for it to tangle on me and snarl, which, you know, you don't want. Okay, so some stuff may be done out of order here, but I'm going to try to, as much as I can, work out from the edge and not leave gaps as my usual. Yeah, I was talking about on a different um, Stitch With Me session, but said it's uh, because of Star Wars that... Uh, we can thank it for uh, THX sound, the good sound in, uh, which they don't really use so much anymore. Everything's Dolby now, but, um, but yeah, they said they went to preview, you know, sort of a rough cut of the movie and the sound was so bad because it was an old theater that they thought they had brought the wrong um, copy. Yeah, because they said it was just like, yeah, because basically it was like the theater was like one big speaker sort of in the center or something, and that was it. There was no mixing, no stereo, no nothing. So, yeah, I said that that was when THX started. And so in order to be THX certified, um, movie theaters had to adhere to certain standards, certain numbers of speakers, and even the construction of the theater like they said, the walls can't be perfectly parallel because otherwise the sound waves will bounce off and sound funny. And uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting, I thought. <clears throat> yeah, because someone was saying the uh, experience of um, watching a movie, you know, in the 80s, and it was like, yeah, open up that 
clamshell case, you know, crack. And then uh, you blast through your speakers, you know, coming soon to own a video, right? Like really loud. And then yeah, it says, oh, okay, phew, I can turn it up. And then, oh no, THX, yeah. It's interesting too, because they said the THX sound actually doesn't get louder at the end it just feels like it does because of the change in the frequency which i thought was really cool but uh yeah so i'm doing this one out of order here like i said because yeah just that's how it worked out i don't feel like adding another thread there but i said i always loved that sound <laughs> it was like the signal to okay here comes story time yeah i found it really satisfying yeah, it was funny because they had a parody of it because it would say, you know, the audience is listening. And so the audience is deaf. Because <laughs> uh, you got deafened by the sound. Uh. Or somebody said they took their grandkid to the movies. And uh, when that THX sound came, the kid was looking around and they said, you know, what are you looking for? And he says, I want to know who has the remote, Grandma. It's too loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually wasn't a big fan of Star Wars growing up. We never really watched it as a Star Trek fan, but my husband likes it, so I watch it with him. Well, I'm not one of those people who thinks that in order to like one thing, you have to hate another. You know, people have this all, oh, Star Wars is better than Star Trek. No, Star Trek's better than Star Wars. I'm like, you can like them both, you know? they're, Yeah, they're both sci-fi, but they're they're different, and that's fine, you know? And I said, you want to tick off everybody in the in both, friend, you know, fandoms, just say that they're basically the same thing. <laughs> now that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I had one time posted a picture of myself wearing an original series Starfleet uniform. And somebody said, oh, Star Wars, nice. And they were not trolling. They were serious. And I'm like, it's Star Trek. And they're like, oh, well, same difference. I'm like, yeah, we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> uh, it's fine if you don't really know them, but don't say they're the same thing because they're not. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I said Star Wars was more, imagine if we just had the same problems in space, you know, and Star Trek was more, hey, imagine if we could be better, you know. So, well, that was basically Firefly too, right? It's just, yeah, the same, the same stuff that we deal with now, just in space. I said to someone, it's like a Western, basically, in space. And yeah, my sister-in-law's like, yeah, I didn't like it. It was like a Western in space. I'm like, oh, that's exactly why I liked it. <laughs> so <laughs> go figure, right? Oh, uh, well, that's why I said Deep Space Nine is probably my, well, not probably, it is. It's my favorite show and my favorite of all the Star Treks. And somebody pointed out, it's kind of like a Western. And I'm like, oh, you know, I never thought of that. But once they said it, it makes sense, you know. It does have similar elements to being like a frontier town or something. Yeah, yeah I was watching a binging on when calls the heart and i'm enjoying it but oh the the hair the hairstyles oh they tick me off so much all the women have their hair down in all these stuff and i'm like it's like 1910 you that didn't happen you know <laughs> like they have this perfect like obviously heat styled you know waves and curls and stuff and i'm like but women all wore their hair up you know <laughs> so yeah, I I enjoy it, but for the storyline, but that annoys me every time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. Why are you going to do that? to tie itself in knots so yeah there's going to be a little bit out of order here like i said because that's just the way it works out <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it's a different experience, I think, when you binge watch stuff versus having an episode every week. Yeah. Because I, apparently, a lot of people complained about Battlestar Galactica. And apparently there was, like, a big gap because I think there was another strike. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. But I think that's what I heard someone say. Because when we watched it, we got it on DVD or Blu-ray. And so we watched the entire thing, you know, beginning to end. And, um... So for us, it was good, but yeah, I could see if you had to take like a year break in between seasons, it could definitely lose its momentum that way. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of people who hated the ending, but I liked it. Well, like I said, I'll watch pretty much anything Ronald D. Moore works on. He did lots of work on Deep Space Nine. And um, I've always said Star Trek The Next Generation took a big step up in how good it was. In season three, that's when Ronald D. Moore joined, which I didn't know at the time, but yeah. I think he started with the episode The Offspring. Or might have been earlier, but that was the one when Data creates a, um, a child. And... Um, that I know was um, Jonathan Frake's first director uh, directing uh, experience was on that episode. And that is one of the best episodes they ever made. In fact, Michael Dorn, who played Worf, said that was his favorite episode, even though he was barely in it, you know. But um, I was always surprised that whenever they had top 10 or top 5 lists and stuff, that that didn't make the top 5 because... Yeah, that was one of the best ones in my opinion, and I absolutely cannot watch it without sobbing, even before I became a parent, but especially after, yeah. Yeah, and I was saying in that, you know, people can... You know, Data doesn't have emotions. And I said, people will never convince me Data doesn't love because, yeah, I said, there he was, you know, desperately trying to save his child's life. And, uh, yeah, you can't convince me that isn't love, even if he doesn't feel it the same way. And somebody said, well, there is a condition where people do feel emotions, but they have trouble attaching words to them or understanding how to express them. And so they said, maybe that's like data. He doesn't have the emotion chip, so he can't process what he's feeling, even if he feels it. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting concept. So yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny because um, Brent Spiner said he was kind of reluctant to take the role because um, like he said, how much um, sort of, you know, acting muscle can you flex playing somebody who has no emotions, right? Like, wouldn't it be kind of a wooden performance kind of thing. And he said that his, um, his agent convinced him and said, look, just take this role. I think it'll be good for you. If you hate it, I'll find a way to break your contract, you know? And, uh, so he listened and he said, yeah, and it ended up actually being his best role, his most known one, his most challenging one. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, you see him in something, you don't say, oh, look, it's Brent Spiner. You say, oh, look, it's Data. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> It's interesting because they were actually going to call him Data, they said. And then during the first table read, um, Patrick Stewart said Data because that's the British way of pronouncing it. And they basically went, oh, I like that. Let's call him Data instead of Data. And so it stuck after that. Yeah. And I mean, you can't imagine him being called Data now, right? He's Data. Ugh. Yeah, I could talk about Star Trek all day. <laughs> yeah, I started watching it when I was 11. Yeah, I was in sixth grade, so that's how I remember. And um, yeah, the show ended its run when I was in high school. And uh, um, what should I call it? Science World in Vancouver had a 
special exhibit about it, so we went to that. That was really fun. Yeah. <sighs> Wait, yeah, I said it was 11 because um, I started school early. Because <laughs> you could start kindergarten at 4 turning 5. And uh, that was when I started, not at 5 turning 6, so... <clears throat> it kind of sucked because everybody was always older than me in my grade. Everyone else started at age five turning six. So yeah, I graduated at 17 and people are like, oh, wow, you know, did you skip a grade? It's like, no, I just started at school early. Ugh. Yeah, it's funny. I was saying my, my son, this semester, he has a spare block at the end of the day. And, uh, yeah, we check with the school. He can leave if he doesn't have class, you know. And so we said, yeah, you can come home early. And, I mean, you've got your own truck, so we don't even have to come get you, right? And he's like, yeah, maybe, but he hasn't yet. I'm like, well, I mean, I guess that's a good sign that he likes his school, you know. <laughs> because I said, man, I sure would have come home early if I had had a spare block at the end of the day and been able to leave whenever I want. Because the thing was, I did have a spare block in my final year of high school but we didn't have our classes rotated so it wasn't the same every day and so your spare block wasn't at the same time so sometimes it was your first block sometimes it was your second right and um plus the fact that uh we actually lived in the next town it was a private school and we had to get bussed in so i mean there's no way i could have go gone home and come back anyway right so yeah yeah, those made for long days. <laughs> yeah, and this was before they started school. You know, they've since um, started school, high school later in the day, at least for a lot of a lot of places, because they discovered that teenagers just naturally have later circadian rhythms, and basically forcing them to get up and learn that early is not really conducive to learning. So, yeah, they discovered if they start school at like say nine kids are more ready and able to learn because yet yeah, you can be conscious and at school at you know 7 30 or something but your brain's not really on for learning right you're just barely trying to stay awake and you can't really learn much I said I don't know how I learned anything <laughs> okay so again I'm gonna go a little out of order here so I'm gonna just work here and then keep building these stripes so do a few out of order but when I said, yeah, I was a natural night owl and I had a hard time falling asleep before like midnight. And then we had to get up at like five in the morning to get ready and catch the bus from out of town. And yeah. And I mean, they gave us so much homework back then that, you know, sometimes I was up until two, three in the morning, even trying to get it done. I remember writing with my head literally down on the desk because I was so tired. I couldn't hold it up anymore. And uh, then you have to get up a couple hours later, right? To, ugh. Go back to school, yeah, ick. Yeah, I'm glad they don't really do homework so much now in this generation, which is good they discovered. It doesn't make any, it doesn't actually help the kids learn more, just burns them out, right? And I said, plus it's frustrating. They would tell you, you know, don't carry so much weight in your backpack. It's bad for your back. I'm like, okay, but if you have like five courses with homework and each one has a textbook and each textbook weighs like three pounds, well, right? I mean, I don't really have a choice as to how much weight is in my darn backpack, right? Ugh. I said it, I mean, that's like saying go for a swim, but don't get wet, right? Like, oh. And this is, you know, not like nowadays when they put a lot of these materials on Google Classroom. So, yeah, my kid can just sign in and look at PDFs and stuff. He doesn't have to lug around a textbook. I think the only textbook I've ever seen him with is, like, uh, for math. That's it. But, yeah, I said, like, when I was in high school, it was one for math and one for science and one for English and, yeah, one for French. And, yeah. And he doesn't have to take French either, which I was surprised because... We moved a lot. I went to more than one school district growing up, and every school district we had to learn French. 
because Canada has two official languages, English and French. So, yeah. My husband didn't have to take it because he's fluent in Hungarian, so that met his uh, second language requirement. But, um, yeah, they don't seem to have it here anymore. Like, um, they have the option here because there was quite, there's quite a large um, French-Canadian population here that they have um, a lot of French immersion schools. So you have the option, but it's not required. Yeah. For a while, my son talked about he wanted to join to do the French immersion. I'm like, yeah, but you know that means I won't be able to help you with your homework because my French is terrible, you know. And uh, yeah, so he ended up not going into that and <laughs> he's glad now because he was kind of disappointed because a lot of his friends were I'm like dude trust me you don't want to do French immersion classes you haven't taken any French it would be really hard to just jump in like that so yeah yeah like I said I don't have the aptitude for languages that's for sure Okay, so I'm going to tie this one off. Oh my gosh. There we go. Yeah, although it's funny because I said, like, my husband's family, they had six kids. And uh, they had the two oldest when they were still living in Hungary. And then they came here and they had the last four. But all of them speak Hungarian. They spoke both at home so that the kids would learn both, but yeah, they said when they went to Hungary that yeah, they they had people that uh, had trouble understanding them because it wasn't as uh, well it's regional, right? It's different. Although they said they had some people who didn't realize they were from Canada and were like, yeah, you know, they'd ask for directions. And they're like, well, how come you don't know? Don't you live here? Because they weren't used to people, you know, under the age of. 30 who can speak Hungarian if you don't live there because yeah it's a very isolated language it's not really spoken much outside of Hungary and they said that's part of what makes it hard to learn is it doesn't really have commonalities with other languages so it's not like say learning Spanish or French you know or Italian which have a lot of the same roots yeah <clears throat> That's why I said, why can you guys have been French? I could at least, I would have had a start, you know, with that. Because <laughs> I studied it for a while. Yeah, and I said, we we're always frustrated because French conjugates verbs, so many verbs. And then I said, yeah, then I found out Hungarian conjugates nouns. <laughs> so, yeah. You don't really use articles as much. You change the ending of the noun to show possession. Yeah, which of course I struggle with. <laughs> oh yeah, you can definitely see the peacock motif here. Yeah, so I was saying I might reach the wall, the pillar here, probably more at the bottom because of following the feathers and it crosses over the edge of the pillar at the bottom. And I'll still have like ocean and stuff to fill in at the top. So yeah, we will see how far we get. Yeah, this means I'm well past the halfway mark on this pass. So that makes me happy. Yeah, when I finish this pass, I will be over a third done. Because, yeah, I'm doing a total of nine passes. However, the top two passes were larger than the subsequent ones. So, yeah, I did 70 rows 
for the first two passes, the rest are 60. And I think the very last pass is short by like two stitches. <laughs> It'll be like 58 or something like that. Almost grabbed the wrong threads, yeah. I realized I was too far away from my grid line for that to be correct. <clears throat> Yeah, my husband's work, they acquired a whole bunch of new locations. So I said, yeah, he's going to be busy. They are hiring more engineers, so he won't have to handle them all himself. But yeah, obviously they have to work together for a bit to get things established. So yeah, I said he's going to be traveling quite a bit for the next year I said, well, it's job security for you. <laughs> uh. didn't quite start at zero for this session, but I was pretty close. Yeah, I'd only done a handful of stitches before I started filming, so. Well, I had to take a nap this morning because, yeah, Rested this last night and couldn't settle. I ended up having to go sleep on the couch because I didn't want to disturb my husband. Ugh. Ooh. Yeah, it's weird. I'm getting more able to take naps as I get older. I really couldn't when I was younger. Just, uh... Well, I just wouldn't be able to fall asleep and also it would just mess up my, my nighttime rest so bad but now I find yeah I actually I'm able to lie down for an hour or two and not have it mess everything up so yeah my kiddo hated taking naps I said I don't get it when I was a kid I I took naps <laughs> you know I took naps up until almost kindergarten yeah he did not want to big fear of missing out with that one he would actually fall asleep sometimes and then throw his arms out to wake himself up again. I was like, come on. And I couldn't swaddle him either because he didn't like that. He was a baby, yeah. If you tried to swallow him, he'd cry and everything until you let him have his arms out. So. Yeah, he wouldn't take any naps till he was about a year and then quit after about eight months so yeah uh yeah i had someone say that to me because they had a really easy going baby and so yeah when my was born she's like isn't it nice when they're newborn and they just sleep all the time i'm like what <laughs> my kid missed that memo yeah uh. and he liked to do his big sleep when he was really young he liked to do it from about six o'clock at night till like 
2, 3 in the morning. Yeah, which really sucks for the adults, yeah. And we tried to keep him awake to see if he would sleep later, but no, didn't happen. So we just sort of had to wait as he got older until he slowly extended that time, but yeah. Because, yeah, I remember I was in a store and some lady was saying her, her kid was being really crabby. And she said, yeah, but she sleeps 12 hours a night, so I won't complain. I said, oh, you know, that's nice. And my sister-in-law, who, again, had a very easygoing baby for her first baby, was like, well, don't all kids? It's like, no, honey. <laughs> they do not. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, she's like, well, she was one of those, she said she was really judgmental. And then she had her second kid, and that kid was, yeah, ball of energy. And, uh, yeah, then she was like, okay, I want to find everybody I judged and be like, I'm so sorry I judged you. I had no idea. <laughs> or, yeah, it's like I saw a meme that said, you know, once upon a time I was a perfect parent. Then I had kids. The end. <laughs> like, yeah, we all think we can do better. When we don't have kids, like somebody said, that's how the human race survives, right? Is that, yeah, you think, oh, it's not that hard. I can do it. No problem, you know. My kid won't misbehave like that, yeah. And then you have one, it's like, oh, yeah. I had no idea what I was talking about. I had uh, one of my friends, she has five. So I remember I was asking her parenting question. She says, I don't know. You should ask me years ago, when, you know, before I had kids, back when I knew everything. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, past a hundred stitches. Woohoo. Oh yeah, I just love this peacock's tail. And there's lots more of it in subsequent passes too. This isn't all of it. This is just the top of his tail feathers. They're still, yeah, almost all the way to the bottom. We get to work on tail feathers at some point. Well, I mean, you can't have a peacock pattern without showing off the tail, right? That is the, that is the important focal point. <laughs> okay, maybe now 07. Yeah, my problem with, uh, trying to find was Heaven and Earth Designs had so many beautiful peacock pieces that it was hard to choose just one. I was between this and another by the same artist that was two dancing peacocks. And uh, yeah, it was hard to choose. I said, I'm not going to stitch both because they are fairly similar. But yeah, it was hard to pick one because they are both gorgeous in their own way. Because that one, yeah, was two peacocks. This one, I think, is a peacock and his mate. Yeah, where I was trying to pick out a wolves pattern again. There were so many gorgeous ones. It was so hard to pick. Yeah. Yeah, there's an end from a different color there. One of the pin stitches is coming through. Okay, so 
So this thread is gonna run out right here. So I'm gonna tie that off and then I'm gonna go back up again and work downwards again. One thing about following the colors like this is I don't have to change colors as often, so it goes a little quicker. Like I said, almost forms stripes. So you can do a bunch with one color before changing to another rather than having to change every couple of stitches, like I would if I was forcing it to, to slope my normal way. My goodness. Oh. Pardon me. Yes, and I was saying they might hire our son to be my husband's assistant again this summer, which he would like. Then he doesn't have to go for interviews. <laughs> uh because he did that last last summer. They had to move a bunch of equipment out of a building because um, they had discovered toxic black mold in it. And so they basically had to abandon the building as if it was on fire kind of thing. And, uh, and I think there was asbestos too. And uh, yeah, so they had to come and collect their equipment, but in order to do so, they had to actually wear gas masks and such, so yeah. But yeah, because it was a building that had some businesses and also some residential. And so he said it was wild. Like he was taking some pictures of the abandoned building because like there were dishes left on counters and clothes left on the floor and stuff. Because again, yeah, people were required to just basically grab your ID and get out of there kind of thing. Like I said, as if it was on fire kind of thing. And yeah, so... Yeah, and it's one of those, it's such a big building that removing the mold would cost them way more than just tearing it down and rebuilding. Yeah. Well, they'd have to remove the mold and the asbestos, I would imagine, too. So, yeah, that's a lot. These are some darker colors here, so I feel safe to pin stitch here. Let's take a look. Okay, so that's sort of one stitch by itself here, so actually I am going to park this one here. It is long enough to do one more stitch, so I'm just pin stitching it to tack it down so that that thread will not get pulled loose by accident. Okay. Yeah, back to working in this corner here. Yeah, probably in another week or so. I'm going to have to move this frame over. Yeah, I bought an 11 by 17 so I wouldn't have to move it as much, but then I discovered holding my top arm that far over the top is uncomfortable, so I end up moving it almost as much as if I was still using an 11 by 11 frame. 
Hmm. Ah, well. I'd rather do that hassle than hurt myself. Yeah. I have to be very careful with how I move. Yeah, my neck is doing much better, so. It was interesting, actually. The pain is usually on the right side, but my acupuncturist said, because she did an assessment, she felt the range of motion in my neck. Like I'd lay down and she manipulated with her hands and she said that, yeah, the, the tight muscles are on the right side, but the problem is more on the left side that there is um, a compression and restriction on the left side. And basically that because of that, probably the muscles on the right side are pulling tight to compensate for things being out, you know, the range of motion being limited and things not being in proper alignment like that. So yeah, I think, I've had two treatments now this go around and I think that I did feel like there was more range of motion in my neck. And so probably because that released things shifted and then it was very sore because yeah, if they've been locked up like that for a long time, years, yeah. Then when they get moving again, it can hurt. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I reminded myself that sometimes it, it has to hurt worse before it starts to do better. Yeah, this got stitched over and pulled out of alignment. I have to be careful not to let that throw me off. In fact, what I do sometimes is okay, let me just finish marking that and tying this off. Yeah, I try not to stitch over the grid line so that that doesn't happen. That is one drawback of sewing on your own, but there is a way to fix it. What I do is go a few blocks away. It's already done here, so I don't really need the grid line anymore. And I'm gonna cut it and pull it free. And then just sort of reweave it over top so that it's lined up correctly. that through a couple times to secure it but then as you can see these are pretty easy to to pull out later yeah there we go so now it's all lined up correctly I don't really worry about this extra tail here sometimes I trim that as well to just make it a little easier to deal with but okay nine five eight so like I said there is a little bit of closing in sometimes when I stitch this way so you can see this one's closed in on three sides instead of two, but it's not closed in on all four. That's sort of the thing I try to avoid the most. I find it's easier to get my needle in and to make the stitches lie neatly next to each other if they're not completely boxed in when you stitch them.
I could keep stitching with this color, but then that would completely close in the one stitch that's above this one here. And so I'm going to instead stop, park, and change colors and work my way down there. saying reach a third done but third done isn't 33 percent it's 33.33 percent so yeah i don't think i'm reaching that this this month next month i think that's that's a pretty a pretty reasonable estimate Yeah, because of the way the colors interlock here, I can't sort of make my edge perfectly smooth. I mean, I could, but that would be a lot more <laughs> hassle than I want to deal with, so...
these super bright colors. I prefer to draw across the back because when they get pulled to the front, they're a real big pain to deal with. They're more noticeable, I find. So. Try not to stitch over another <laughs> another grid line there. Less than 80 stitches, and I'll reach 96,000 even. Woohoo! Goodness, why are you being so uncooperative? It's this needle. Oh yeah. So far it's working okay, but yeah. I don't lose needles, I have to discard them when they get too worn out. Yeah. If I find it's constantly splitting the floss or it won't thread easily, then that usually means it's time to set it aside.
right here is row 200, which is where I, I'm cutting off this pass. Check the length of both of these threads. Right. This one's a longer one. Okay. Juggle both of them for a bit. Dear. <laughs> what the heck happened there? Make sure there's no snarl on the back. I said there wasn't, but something's not right there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know what this thing is doing. <laughs> Weird. Let's try that again. Okay, that was weird. I must have caught it around my finger or something. It's all nice and smooth now but for some reason it wasn't before. So I have threads in either side here. They're just going to kind of meet in the middle. I'm going to stitch with this one as I go. So that it doesn't have to reach as long for parking it in the two uh, stitches below. thread and work in from the other side.
think I may just work down to this bottom of this pass here in this area and then that will be where I'll take a break. thinking this is going to get more into the brown part of the feather.
thread it as I was trying to get it through the eye of the needle there. getting in my way. And it seems secure enough. today. Threads keep pulling unevenly for some reason. A lot of colors in this very last roll right before the right before this grid line. Uh, sometimes it just works out that way.
So I'll do these four and then the one that I just parked and then that's where I'm going to take a break. Which was quite productive, I think. Over 200. Yeah, like I said, like this whole eye motif here, pretty much done today. Okay, so yeah, I said I would work down to that line there. So there we are, 233 done. Pretty happy with that. So thank you so much for joining me today and hope to see you here next time. All right, thanks everyone. Bye.